And the moment that you run out of ideas for blog posts, if you say to yourself, we're just, we just run clean dry, it's because literally you've stopped listening to those customers, those clients, those prospects that you service every day. I'm going to show you over this next 40 minutes or so how this principle, how this golden rule does work, and it works incredibly well. When we started this process of, um, of getting our swimming pool company out of trouble, I said, I'm going to take every single question that I've ever been asked over the 10-year period that we've been doing this. I'm just going to answer it on our website. I'm going to take each question, turn it into a title of a blog post, and then I'm going to answer it. And that's what I would suggest that you do. If you haven't started a blog, and even ones that have, it's amazing to me how many companies haven't just done this. Brainstorm as a group. Every person in your company that talks to real people every day, and say, what are the questions you get via email, via text, via face-to-face, -face, via phone? Those are the questions that should be the titles of your blog posts. Those are the first things that you should be writing about. Not a bunch of crazy stuff that's happening with your company. You should be answering the questions that people want to know every single day. The problem is, though, most people don't want to answer these questions. They just want to ignore them. It's kind of like the ostrich with their head in the sand. You know, if you look at what an ostrich does, and, you know, I, I talk about ostrich marketing a lot because so many companies – really embrace this mentality and that is if they hear a question and they don't like the question they just don't bother answering it answering it in other words they just bury their head in the sand and like the ostrich they think that over time it's going to go away but just like the ostrich that when it brings its head back out of the sand the problem is still there we as businesses have got to be willing to address everything we can if we're willing to be that company, nobody is going to be like us. That's going to put us in a very, very different, uh, different crowd. Uh, it's going to put us in such a unique situation as a company. Now, there are certain subjects that nobody at all wants to talk about, and these are the ones that I'm going to hit on today. I'm going to show you how they work for me and other companies that I've worked with. There are subjects that people in every industry want to search. They want to ask about. Price, problems, comparison slash versus, the best, and reviews. If you center your content marketing campaign around questions in these five categories, I'm telling you, really cool things are going to happen. So let's look at it specifically how it works. All right, so when I started uh, with my swimming pool company, this process of content marketing in, in what was March of 2009, I said, okay, I've got this golden rule. If they've ever asked a question, I'm going to answer it. Well, what's the first question that you get every single time somebody calls your company? Well, if it's not a first question, you get it within the first five minutes. Yes, how much does it cost? How much does the service cost? And, you know, sometimes we don't like to answer that question. And even more so, very few answer it on their own website, much less address it. So let me ask you a question, though. How many of you out there have ever shopped for something online? And, of course, if you're listening to this webinar, I know that you have. And when you search for stuff online and how much it costs, and you cannot find the answer on that particular website for how much it costs, if you can't find any information about pricing, what do you do? Well, the answer, of course, as you've already thought in your head, is you leave, you bounce, you exit quickly because you're impatient just like me. We're all impatient when it comes to searching online. And so what's so very interesting is we are all very frustrated when we go to a website and we can't find pricing information. But when it comes to our company, 98% of the time, and this is a true number because I have run this survey over and over again at all the conferences I've spoken at, most companies never talk about cost and price on their website. It is a tragedy. The number one question I got, as I said before, was how much does a fiberglass pool cost? So because I was following that golden, golden rule, the first question that I answered on my website was how much does a fiberglass pool cost? That was the first article that I wrote when I embraced this new mentality. And I compared it to buying a car, and I said, you know, there's, there's a lot of options here that you might consider, and, and, and therefore, because of that, it's going to range. Well, after we wrote that article, within the next, I think it was about 48 hours, it became number one on Google for a slew of cost-related phrases. So if you look at this, this list right here, this is just a couple of them. Average cost of fiberglass pools, fiberglass pool cost, price of fiberglass pool, 
uh, on and on and on. There's actually hundreds, I'm not kidding you, hundreds of keywords this one article ranks for simply because we said we're not going to be the ostrich with our head in the sand. Once we started showing up for those keywords and started getting all those visits, then we started seeing some significant results in terms of people filling out forms saying, hey, I want to have an appointment with you all. I want to talk about pools. This is our set of the most uh, typed in keywords that people found us with from 2009 to June of 2012. Now, some of you are going to say, well, how do you get this type of uh, data? Well, I suggest that you use a, a beefier analytics than just Google Analytics. And you're going to see this throughout this presentation because a lot of these analytics are not possible unless you're using something like, in my case, a HubSpot, H-U-B-S-P-O-T, or an Eloqua or Marketo. There's so many out there. Uh, that are just popping up left and right. You need greater lead intelligence so you can truly measure the ROI, the return on investment, of your content marketing and your social media efforts. So every red arrow you see here came as a result of that one article that I wrote because these are keywords that we now rank for that we didn't rank for before. We would not have gotten these visits, these thousands of visitors, had we not written that article. And with those visitors, we had – each one of these groups, a certain percentage were filling out forms saying, hey, Marcus, come to our house, give us a price on a swimming pool. So you can see there's over, well over 100 sales appointments that we had from this one article. And because of that, and because we have this tracking capability, we can see those leads that turn into customers. So far, my updated number for this, because I constantly track it, this one single article has made our struggling swimming pool company back then, not now, $1.7 million in sales. $1.7 million we would not have had. That might not be a big number for some of you listening to this. That might be a really big number for some of you listening to this. But this, this, if you put this in a scale to your business, the point is if you produce content that people really want to know about, especially based on consumer-based questions, and then you measure the results, you can have an amazing return on investment for this stuff. I've seen it over and over again. Usually cost articles are the best of any of them because they're so available from a search perspective. So let's keep going here. I'm going to show you further how this golden rule works. Let's say that you met with a concrete pool guy after you had met with Marcus the pool guy back when I, back when I still sold pools. And by the way, I still own this swimming pool company, River Pools and Spas. And everything that I'm telling you today, I hope that you open up browsers and test what I'm saying. You know, I want you to open up your browser and, and test fiberglass pool costs or cost of fiberglass pools, fiberglass pool prices, all these things, because it's going to take you through that funnel that all of my visitors go through as well. So today, I don't sell pools, but I still have, I'm a silent partner with the company, and I still play with the analytics, and I still look at it, and it's unbelievable how much this continues to grow. But getting back to this, say you met with a concrete pool installer after you met with Marcus, the fiberglass pool guy, and you told him, okay, so I met with Marcus. I think I want fiberglass. I think I want a fiberglass pool. What do you think he's going to tell you about fiberglass pools? Yes, that's right. He's going to tell you how bad fiberglass pools stink. He's going to tell you how they have problems, how they're too skinny, how they're too short, how, they're, um, how you can't customize them, how it's practically a bathtub, how you have nothing but problems if you get them. Problems, problems, problems. And then you're going to be left with this huge dilemma as to what you do. And whenever we have a huge dilemma and we don't know the answer of a problem that we have, what do we do today? Do we go to our spouses? Do we go to our best friends? Do we go to our preachers? No. We go to one place, and that is the big G because in Google we trust. It's amazing, amazing what we will search in Google. <laughs> Some really freaky stuff people type in Google all the time. We go there for all the answers. But the question is why do we go there for all the answers? Because we think we will get it. And we've been trained over these last few years as we've been attending this thing I call the school of search. We've been trained that if we keep looking and if we're more specific, that we will get the reward. <clears throat> That's the idea. And so let's say that person that was freaked out about the fiberglass pool problems after they liked fiberglass pools and they liked Marcus, but the concrete guy scared them, what are they going to type in Google? Well, what would you type in? You'd probably type in fiberglass pool problems, right? 
Well, knowing that I had been asked over the years, hey, Marcus, you know, I've heard a lot. Be honest. What are the problems with fiberglass pools? What are the, some of the potential issues? I went ahead and I wrote about that. Um, actually, my business partner, Jason, did from the pool company. And, uh, and it's called the Top 5 Fiberglass Pool Problems and Solutions. And within this article, it's very, very honest. It's completely unbiased. It's just real as it gets. But here's what's so interesting about this article. As soon as we wrote this article, as you might have guessed, and go ahead and test this in another window right now, uh, we showed up number one for any fiberglass pool problem, issue, concerns, whatever you want to call it, phrase, that you can possibly think of. And because of that, we started getting lots of visitors. And because of all those visitors, we started generating a ton of trust. This was something that nobody else was doing. Now, these are the keywords, again, from my site that have produced the most appointments over the last year. The number one keyword that has produced appointments for my site is River Pools and Spas. It's the name of my company, so it doesn't really count because they were already looking for me. But the other keywords are very powerful. Cost of fiberglass pools certainly was one last year. But the number one keyword that generated appointments was an article that talked about problems with my very product. Think about that. How is that possible? Well, because everybody else is schlepping with sales lingo and jargon and all this stuff, that one company that's willing to be honest online and say, you know what? Our product may or may not be for you. Here is the audience that it's for. Here is who it is not for, and you can make your choice. If you do this, you'll get results. People constantly search for problems of products and services. They do it all the time. Just like if you're getting ready to buy a Ford Mustang, you might type in problems Ford Mustang 2013 or negative reviews Ford Mustang 2013. That's what you're going to type in. That's the way consumers search. And the person or persons, the company that's willing to address these types of thoughts of the consumer, they're going to be ultra successful. This one article has made our company over $500,000 in sales that I've been able to track to date since we wrote it, all because we were willing to be the opposite of the ostrich with our head in the sand. And I want to remind you, this applies to everybody. Don't think right now we're B2B, B2C. I know I said it earlier. Don't let those thoughts creep into your head. This absolutely applies to you. The next one that applies to you, and I always love showing this visual because it's, you know, obviously it's just it's the two greatest actors that ever lived here, right? Versus comparisons. Who is better? We love to go online and we love to compare stuff. We love competition. That's just how we are. And I would ask you, have you ever gone online before and, uh, and, and said, okay, this versus that, which is better, or this product versus that product? You know, we do this all the time. Every company that I've ever worked with, with content marketing, they have tons of versus comparative related questions that they get from their prospects, their clients, and their customers. We certainly had that with swimming pools. And this is where I understand and start to discover the power of versus. So people used to ask me all the time questions like, Marcus, uh, we like concrete. You sell fiberglass. Which is better? Or we are thinking about a vinyl liner pool, in-ground pool, and you sell fiberglass. You know, which one is better? Or, you know, above-ground pools versus in-ground pools, which is better? Well, if you've already picked up on the theme here, you know the theme is they ask, you answer. So I wrote articles on all that stuff. The first article that I really wrote that was a powerful versus article was fiberglass versus vinyl versus concrete pools, which is better. It's the most unbiased versus article you ever read from somebody that just sells one of the three products. I hope you'll go online right now and you'll type some of these phrases in. We're number one on these and every single versus related post you can possibly think of. And two, versus extends to like, Let's say within your company, people can choose two different products, and you're always, and they come to you and say, okay, well, I know I want to use, use this or this one. Which would you suggest that I go ahead and purchase? Well, that's an article that you should be writing. It should already be answered on your website somewhere, certainly within your blog, within a video, somewhere on the site. All right? Versus is extremely powerful. I've uh, accumulated a ton of sales that I would not have had had I not written so many versus posts. You can do this about manufacturers in your industry, different vendors in your industry, on and on and on, different service mes uh, methodologies, construction methodolo methodologies. I'm telling you, there's so many examples, and I've, I've, again, it applies to every single industry. 
So speaking of that, and we're just zipping through these because I'm just, I want to get to your questions. If you have any questions, I want you to see how this works. The power of the best awards and reviews. Have you ever gone online before and you typed in what is the best such and such, or um, a review of such and such? Or have you ever read those magazines that are like um, Consumer Digest, Best Buy Awards, and all those? Have you ever done that? Well, I, I, um, I, I you know, people used to ask me all the questions. Margaret, what is the best uh, swimming pool? Or who's the best manufacturer? And I knew they were asking these questions. I knew if they were asking the questions, they were typing it online. So it only made sense that I answered it in my They Ask You Answer campaign. And so we did that. And let me give you a couple of crazy examples that would make you scratch your head. And people are baffled when I show these examples and uh, how well they worked. All right, ready for this? So you've seen those uh, Best Buy Consumer Digest Awards for like uh, um, for auto magazines and stuff like that. Well, it, as you can probably imagine, they didn't have any type of magazine like that for the fiberglass pool industry um, when I started this process four years ago. So I said, well... You know, if nobody's doing it, nobody's come up with an award system, why don't I? And so I wrote an article in 2010, and it was called Small In-Ground Fiberglass Pool Design Awards for 2010. And basically what I did is I am a fiberglass pool builder, and there's all these big manufacturers out there. It's kind of like, to, to make an analogy, I'm a Chevrolet dealer, and there are, there's, you know, Chevrolet, there's Ford, there's Lexus, there's Toyota, all those manufacturers. Well, that's what I... That's what my swimming pool company is like for, um, for the fiberglass pool industry. And so I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give out different awards to these manufacturers, ones that I'm actually competing with in terms of their products. I'm going to give out different awards. So I'm going to say, who's the best kidney-shaped pool? Who's the best rectangle pool? Who's the best freeform pool? And I gave it out literally to those manufacturers that I was selling against. Now let me ask you a question. If you're a manufacturer – and you see this happen, how do you think they reacted? What do you think they did? Now, keep in mind, they had never received an award before. Nobody had ever really mentioned them. Nobody had given them any love. And so if you guessed that they started linking to me from their websites, you're absolutely right. Let's show some more stats, shall we? Because I don't like theory. I want you to see the real deal. We got too much theory in this industry. People want results, and this, my friends, is results. So this is the on-page analytics for that one single blog article that I wrote, that small in-ground fiberglass pool design awards article. So these are some of the keywords, just a few of them, that it ranks for in Google. All right, and you can see it ranks for every stinking small in-ground pool, small pool designs, uh, small fiberglass pools. I mean, all this stuff it ranks for, uh, number one or two on Google. But what's cool about this, if you go over here, You'll notice that other than the fact that it ranks for over 100 keywords itself, it's got over 211 inbound links. That's a lot of dang links for a little swimming pool company. The thing about it is a lot of those links are coming from my competition. They're coming from the competitors. This article was huge. Competitors were like, like the Fords and the Chevys. They were coming on and they were commenting on this. And, you know, now I do it every year and I do it with huge success. I would challenge you to think of awards that you can hand out in your industry. They might be direct to your industry. They might be indirect. I'm not saying you've got to reward your competitor down the street, but let's say that you sell a, a lawnmowers and you want to give out awards for some of the best lawnmowers. It's okay to give out an award to John Deere, to Husqvarna, and to anybody else that makes a lawnmower that you think is noteworthy. Now, you might ask, well, why, if I talk about the competition – that's going to let them know about the competition. That's a bad thing. No, because they already know about the competition. That's why they have the Internet. Stop fooling yourselves. I'm not saying you're this guy, but there's a lot of this guy out there that's so afraid of giving the competition any love or any mention or any anything. Oh, I can't even talk about my prices because the competition is going to find out. Stop worrying about them. Start worrying about what the consumer wants. That's the guiding light. Going back to it, they ask, you answer this is cool stuff. All right, but it gets better. Let me show you how this works. All right, so people used to ask me all the time, Marcus, we like you, but who are some of the best pool builders in this area? And so, like, let's say I was in Richmond, Virginia, and they'd say, who are some of the other pool builders you'd recommend in Virginia? You know, usually when we get asked that question, 
We never mention our competitors, do we? No, we don't. We always say, oh, no, we're special, we're different, we're unique, nobody's like us, blah, blah, blah. And again, they've already probably vetted us anyway. They know who our competitors are. Half the time it's a test. Well, I said, I'm going to take this golden rule to the next level. And so I wrote an article, who are the best swimming pool builders in Richmond, Virginia, reviews slash ratings. Now, you go into this article, what you'll find is you'll find five pool builders listed. And go ahead and uh, type in best pool builders Richmond, Virginia right now, and you'll uh, find the article if you want to read along. So what's so interesting about this is of the five that I mentioned, do you think I included my company, River Pools and Spas, in this list of five? Hmm? Some of you are thinking yes. Some of you are thinking no. Well, the answer is no. And the reason is because if I do include myself in a list of these five, what happens? That's right. I lose credibility. I lose trust. And that's not what the great content marketer does. The great content marketing company thinks of themselves as a Wikipedia, as a teacher. And that's their approach to this information. What's so profound about this is I have made so many sales off of this one article in different ways. I've had a lot of people type in best of pool builder Richmond, Virginia. And oh, by the way, right now, if you're a location-based business, if you want some awesome kicking location-based um, organic search stuff, Go ahead and, and, and produce articles for every major um, city that you work in and do best of. So let's say that you are a, um, a roofing company. So you say best roofing companies, Dallas, Texas. You see what I'm saying? You can do this about web companies, service companies, product. It doesn't matter what you do. It's all the same thing. People love to search for best of companies and then the location. This works. But it gets even better. Because of the fact that I mentioned my, employ my uh, competitors here, Let's say you go online right now and you type in reviews, play more pools, Richmond, Virginia. And by the way, people constantly vet. They vet competitors, they vet companies. I had a lady call me this year and she said, Marcus, it's crazy. I was getting ready to buy a pool from play more pools and I typed in reviews, play more pools, Richmond, Virginia, and your article came up. And I read it and I was like, gosh, this guy is so honest. But I got to talk to him too. So for whatever reason, she had never seen me. She did not find me. She wouldn't have found me unless I had written this article. This one single article about Richmond, Virginia, and best of pool builders last year, 2012, made our company about $150,000 in sales. Now, of course, I've written other best of articles like Virginia Beach and Northern Virginia, lots of best of articles. Because people in those areas, they generally type in their area, and so I wanted the location-based keyword phrases. This is really, really powerful. It works. It, your competitors will smack their foreheads, and they won't understand why you are doing it. But I'm telling you, that lady that vetted that company found our site and got an appointment with us, bought a pool. That's a conversation I never would have had had I not written this article. Now, sometimes people say to me, well, aren't you scared they're going to find your competition? Again, no. If you haven't figured out, I don't care about the competition. I don't base fear tactics on the competition. I'm more fearful of not being in the conversation. If you break out the essence of content marketing, it's that you want to control the conversation about stuff. And so if somebody's asking the question, you want to control the conversation in your house. Your house is your website because now you have the capability to push them down the funnel further and have influence on them. It's truly, truly profound. And by the way, for those of you that have questions, we're going to answer them uh, in about 15 minutes. We're going to have 15 minutes at the end of this, and so store those questions because I can't wait to answer them because I know some of you right now might be scratching your head saying, I don't know how this would work. I'm telling you it works, and I've done it in a multiplicity of industries now. I've done it. I, mean, I wish I could go down the list of some of the different like software firm, firm, I have Department of Defense. I mean, I've got all types of crazy things that I'm doing with content marketing. These companies, it works. It works. All right. So let's keep going for a second because, you know, what we've talked about so far is the strategy that we used. And that strategy that we used, if you look in March of 2009, the green represents organic search traffic. Red represents pay-per-click. This was my swimming pool company. And because it's seasonal, it goes up and down like a wave. Today, our little swimming pool company is the most trafficked swimming pool website in the world. And it's all because we answer all the questions that you ask as a pool consumer. And oh, by the way, 
if you look at this yellow that grew and grew and grew, that's inbound links from other companies. Our site now has thousands and thousands of inbound links. And I've never tried to get a single inbound link ever, but it's got thousands because of this they ask, you answer approach. Now, I want to close up with talking about an incredibly important subject. No, not Brad Pitt or Jonah Hill, but about this concept of Moneyball. Now, some of you might have seen that movie. It's a really good movie, by the way. It's not so much just sports. It's about life and all these cool things. But anyway, there's this guy named Billy Bean, and Brad Pitt was playing his character. And if you recall in the movie, Billy Bean had a problem. He was the, he was the general manager of the Oakland Athletics. And he didn't have enough money to bring in great players. And so he had a marketing budget dilemma. And so this guy, Jonah Hill, comes to him and he says, look, man, there is a way that we can skirt around this, this money thing and we can just focus on one single number in terms of how we bring in our players. And that number is on-base percentage. And so they base their entire, quote, marketing campaign around one single number. It was the money ball effect, if you will. And it caused them to do amazing things that year because they – had this magical equation. Very, very cool story. Well, there's a money ball effect with content marketing. Content marketing has certain tipping points. And I want to show you how this works. There is a magical number for every company out there. For me, that number is 30. I'm going to tell you about a quick story. The beginning of 2011, I looked at every, excuse me, 2012, I guess it was. It might have been 11. But time flies. I looked at everybody that had filled out a form on our website and said, okay, I want an appointment, right? So they filled out a form and not bought a pool. And then I looked at everybody that had filled out a form and bought a pool. So two groups of people, not bought a pool, filled out a form, filled out a form, bought a pool. What do you think the main difference was between these two groups of people? Well, if you guessed 30, you're right. <laughs> You're asking, what does that 30 mean, Marcus? Well, that 30 represents page views, <clears throat> excuse me, or the number of page views that person saw. What we found is that if somebody read 30 pages of the website before we went on a sales appointment, they would buy 80% of the time. Now, considering the industry average for swimming pools is about a 15% closing ratio for sales appointments, this was pretty dang awesome. And so once we realized we had this tipping point, this money ball effect with 30 page views, we made every possible move to make sure these people were consuming our content. Our, our content. In other words, before I went on appointments, I would send out an ebook. I would send out certain blog articles and videos. I would make the client, the prospect, I would make them read it before that initial appointment. So by the time we got there every single time, they had tipped, and our closing rate shot through the roof. And this is when I realized the true magic of content and the magic of page views and how most of us sell page views short. In fact, if I had to ask you how many page views would somebody read on your site, what would you say? The average customer, what would they be willing to read on your site? Well, let me see if I can change that vision in your head. And that vision for most companies is somewhere between ah, a couple pages, maybe five, max. It's a crying shame because people will consume way more than that. This is a real person right here named William Grizzard. Now, this is a lead sheet that I have. Again, I use HubSpot. There's other types of uh, analytics tools out there, but if you want these types of analytics tools, you got you, you got to get one because again, Google Analytics ain't enough. So I know this guy, William Grizzard. He did an organic search. He was using Yahoo, which is interesting in and of itself, and then he typed in cost of fiberglass pool. Well, we already know where he landed. He landed on that blog article. But what he proceeded to do next was pretty profound. Yes, he read 375 pages of the site, 131 unique pages, and he just kept going back to certain ones because apparently he really liked it. So now what do we know about this guy, William Grizzard? Some of you are thinking he's a freak, he's a stalker. <laughs> well, Truth is, William Grizzard, he's a consumer. He is today's consumer in the information age. 375 pages. But the story doesn't stop there. Some of you are not going to believe this, but this is true. That same night when I was looking at my lead forms that came in that day, 
another person had filled out a form. This time, it was a Mrs. Grizzard. And she did an organic search in Yahoo as well. And she typed in Richmond, Virginia Pools. And then she proceeded to read 149 pages. So between this couple that apparently loves to learn about swimming pools, we've got about 525 pages of content read. Holy shnikes. Pretty awesome, right? Well, what do you think that sales appointment was like when I went out to the house? <laughs> These people, there was no sale. When I got there, they had a spreadsheet. It had the pool they were getting. It had every single option they were getting. And all they needed was one single number. Yeah, they just needed the price. That was it. That's all I needed. And that's the power of content. That's the power of content. Because the reality is we have no idea how much information viewers will consume on our websites until we give it to them. None. Do you realize the average number of pages that a customer that bought a pool for me last year viewed on our website was 105? It's shocking. I never would have believed that until I learned the power of content and just how much information people consume if it's good information. That information they read, it wasn't about me and my awesome sauce and how my company was so dang cool. This was information that was just answering their questions. If you want sexy content, folks, answer somebody's question. That's really, really sexy. We have this overblown mentality of what is epic and awesome and sexy and all this other stuff. Awesome epic content is anything that helps somebody say, aha, I understand, I get it, this makes sense. We need to get to a point as companies where we realize and accept that content is the greatest sales tool in the world, period. It truly is. It is the greatest sales tool in the world, but we've got to use it the right way. We've got to leverage it. Every salesperson on your staff should be in love with the company blog. They should be participating with the company blog, as I wrote on my site today. They should be using each one of those blog articles as ammo to help them. It should be a gift that keeps on giving their content, the content you're producing, they're producing, that everybody's producing, and that they look for every opportunity to help the consumer to do just that, to consume. So the moral of the story is this. If we want to be great at content marketing, we don't have to think outside the box. We just have to answer every single question in the world. We just have to be the Wikipedia of our industry. Yes, it helps if you leverage those around you. But if you do leverage those around you within your staff, whether you're an army of one or an army of 100, this is possible. I've got clients that are just one and two people, and they kill it. I've got clients that are over 100 employees. And they've got 40, 50, 60 of those employees that are producing content, and they're really killing it. I've written all about this on the salesline.com within my ebook. This ebook that you see here, it took me over two years to write. It's free, it doesn't cost you anything. It's inbound and content marketing made easy. And it's changed lives all over the globe because it's a very non theoretical explanation of exactly what you need to do compounded more of what I said today to increase your traffic, your leads, your sales, to build your brand, to build your bottom line with content marketing. So with that, I'm going to close up and I'm going to see Justin if we have any questions and maybe you could jump in here and let me know if we do have any. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump back here. Um, let's take a look. Uh, this is something that you, you did cover a couple of times, but uh, maybe you can give a, a little bit more detail on some suggestions for software programs on measuring the ROI. Okay. So how it works, gang, is when you measure ROI, somebody has to fill out a form on your site. I'd actually prefer somebody fill out a form than call me because if they fill out a form, now I can start tracking them. All right? And so um, I use HubSpot, but there are other tools that do this as well. So, for example, one that does it is Marketo. One that does it is Eloqua. Um, Infusionsoft does it a little bit. 
and they all fit different markets. Like Infusionsoft and HubSpot are would be more affordable. And then Marketo, I mean, not more affordable. I mean, it just depends on the size of your company, really. I'm actually doing a – I just did a big article, a versus article on the sales line on Infusionsoft versus HubSpot. That's why if you go online right now and you type in Infusionsoft versus HubSpot, you'll find an article that I wrote about – that me and my team wrote about it. Um, that's why this stuff works across the board, this whole versus cost and everything stuff. But you've got to have them fill out a form. Once they fill out a form, that software attaches a cookie to their IP address. Now we can see their behavior on the site. We can see what pages they viewed. We can see how much time they were on the site. We can see what keyword they typed in, assuming that they're not falling under Google's privacy. So there's all these things that we can find out. If you give your sales people this type of leverage going into an initial phone call or sales appointment, think about how much more effective it will be to know that this person has read 150 pages and they've had all these questions already answered. Wow, that's a different type of lead. That's a different type of prospect. And so if you do have HubSpot questions, um, you can certain. I mean, I've answered a lot on the sales line because I am, I'm a HubSpot partner. But again, it's not the only one that's available to you, and it's something that you want to look at strongly if you're interested in ROI. Absolutely. Okay, we have another good question here from Maggie Flickinger. She is wondering, uh, you talk about your website and your blog interchangeably. How are these two channels best connected? Yeah, that's a great question, Maggie. And I probably should have clarified this early on. I see a blog defin – the definition of blog today is completely different than it was just a year or two ago. And when I say blog, I'm referring to it as from the business side, okay? Not just like you have a little blog and you talk about going to the beach today, you know, you and your kids, whatever. That's cool, but that's not what I'm referring to. When I say blog, I'm talking about a business one. Now, a blog today is just this. It's a way of formatting information on your website in an organized manner for people to find what they're looking for quickly in a categorical format. That's all a blog is. And so, like, my River Pools blog, or excuse me, my River Pools website has two blog areas. In other words, they're separate category, main, like, themes, and so they're separate blogs. And um, that's just the way that I do it. And uh, you can't look at your blog as being a separate entity because every blog – article you write is just another page of your website. That's why if you have a choice, you want the blog not to be on a subdomain. You don't want it to be blog.yourwebsite.com if you have a choice. It's preferable that yourwebsite.com slash blog article, right? That's the way that you want to do it. Don't see a blog anymore as a separate entity. See it just as pages on your website that are organized so people can view them easily. Absolutely. Okay. We've got a few questions here regarding PPC, pay-per-click. Um, Word. Mostly, mostly, mostly surrounding um, kind of where PPC falls into the content marketing world and then um, talk about leads. Yeah. You know, I like PPC. Moving towards the organic. I like PPC if you measure PPC. So let me give you, again, real numbers. I wish I had time to dive into this further with you. Last year we sold about 85 pools. Um, something like 70 was from organic search results. Another eight or nine was from PPC. I know that because, again, advanced analytics. Um, I spent um, about, what was it? I forget. I think I spent $10,000 roughly on PPC last year for my pool company. But because I sold around nine pools, that's about $450,000 in sales. So it was a pretty heavy return on investment. But most companies never know that. Most companies have no clue if PPC is making them a dang thing. They think it, but they don't really know it. So first of all, if you're going to do PPC, you sure as heck better measure it and have a better idea of the return on investment. Right? Second, PPC is a great bridge to get you to the content marketing promised land. And so let's say that you're just building up your blog, your website, Build your content, your SEO, all this stuff, and you're just not getting a lot of traffic yet. PPC might be the means whereby you know you're getting those leads until you're able to build it up enough. Should you ever eliminate PPC if it's not measuring a return on investment? Yes, but you can have the greatest blog in the world. Like for swimming pools, I had that and I used PPC, and I don't need PPC, but I don't certainly mind having those additional nine or ten sales for pools a year. 
And so that's how I would approach PPC if I was you. Always make sure you're measuring it. That's the key. Right, we've got a good question here from Mark Hopwood. Um, you know, definitely a, a topic that's on the forefront of most small business owners' mind, which is social media. Can you talk a little bit how social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, even LinkedIn, can influence the ROI of the content and the blogs? Yeah, this is great. Um, and I'm a little bit of a renegade when it comes to this, Mark. And it's a good question, man. But here's the problem. We, I think we're, we're starting to reach semi-maturity when it comes to social media. Because there was an age there over the last few years where all businesses wanted to talk about was likes and tweets and stupid metrics and numbers that didn't pay the bills. You as a small business owner, Mark, you know what I'm talking about, right? Your biggest interest is what is going to help me pay bills? What is going to generate leads directly or possibly indirectly? I will tell you that not every business is really meant for Twitter and Facebook, at least from, an, from a return on investment standpoint, even LinkedIn. Um, but not every business really should be all about, quote, blogging either. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I have a friend who owns a restaurant. He's, um, he's a client, actually. He, um, he has people coming in every week. They're the same people. They come back again and again and again. So although we have some con you know, a decent amount of content on there and, and a, a focus on SEO, we do a lot with his Facebook page because people are constantly flowing in. Facebook is not so great for finding as much as it is for retaining your existing customer base. And so if you have the type of business where people always come back, like a retail business, a clothing store, a restaurant, something like that, well, then Facebook or Twitter even can be more effective. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. And afterwards, I don't have a retail store or any of that stuff. And so it's quite different. Far and away, the highest return I have with swimming pools is a, a complete focus on great content um, combined with SEO. I call that search content marketing. It's, I, I believe that is really the future in the now, too. And so I didn't do anything really with Facebook and Twitter with my pool company. It would have been, for the most part, a waste of my time because it would have been time better spent had I been producing content. People just don't go on Facebook or on Twitter and brag about how they just spent $50,000 on a swimming pool. They just don't do that. Now, on the other hand, you take the sales line. The sales line is more dependent on social media shares um, to generate traffic, leads, and potentially sales. I still, though, the majority of my clients from the sales line come from keyword targeted phrases, those they ask you answers that we have on the sales line that are so um, that are prolific there, just like they are at river pools. But every industry is different. And you might be in an industry, Mark, where LinkedIn is the key. That's why oftentimes there's some experimentation needed. I experimented with river pools and found out, okay, I'm just really going to focus on content because I can see that's where my customers are. With SalesLine, it's more of a diverse approach. With your business, I can't say which one it's going to be, but it does depend. I'll also say this. We got to be careful because oftentimes people will try to be a jack of all social media trades. They end up being a master of none. It's much better that you're a master of one first and that you branch out. So get great with your content first, maybe, in 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 your blog post and your you know your approach of they ask you answer. Do that well. Sure, you can share it on Facebook and Twitter and stuff as you go. But then you might want to say, okay, I've done a great job there, and I'm going to really start to to focus on my Facebook page because the companies that try to be great all at one time with these things, they end up just failing miserably, very miserably. And oh, by the way, just a side tangent, blog comments is not a metric for success at all. I, um, it's just not. It, you can never trade comments in for your mortgage payment. I've got over 20,000 comments on the sales line and, um, and you know, just generally speaking, the ones that mostly comment on that blog are people that are already in the industry. If it's a client, usually it's a private email. It's not a comment. So my point in saying that is comments are fine. Comments are great for like interaction, ideas, nurturing, things like that. But as a, a KPI, a key performance indicator of success with your content marketing, 
I would not put blog comments up there whatsoever, even though I have thousands and thousands. Great point. I've got time for two more questions. This is fun, um, Justin. The first... Keep coming, man. <laughs> I know we got a ton here. Um, a lot of people, have, before I, I give you these questions, a lot of people have been asking if the presentation will be available. Um, we will have it available that will be emailed out to everyone that did register, so look for that in your inbox soon. Um, one question I have here is, uh, again, Maggie with a great question. Uh, once you have a library of high traffic blog posts, can the frequency of new posts taper off or even stop altogether? I yeah, think Maggie, I know the answer to this one, but I'll let you take this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, you know, again, it depends. It depends on where you are with your sales. You know, the, the, the best mentality is never let off the gas. But if, you've, if you're just clearly just generating tons of leads and if you want to let off the gas, some, that's your choice. That's a marketing decision. I'd be lying if I said I continue to write three to four articles a week at River Pools because I don't. I certainly did for the first year, but I'm on top of my industry. It's a snowball. It continues to grow. Um, now I tinker more with just, you know, just ideas and concepts and things like that. And I can't say what you should do in your case. It depends on a lot of factors. But ultimately, the safest thing is if you can keep your foot on the gas, <laughs> go ahead and do it. But I, I don't want you to burn out either if you've if you really gotten comfortable. I would say, you know, also, once you've got those content out there, you see how you can refurbish, recycle it. So you might want to um, – you might want to turn it into an ebook. So, like inbound and content marketing made easy is a combination of, I mean, it's 250 plus pages for a reason. It's it's all the blog articles that I've written specifically about inbound and content marketing on the sales line in, the, in an organized manner, and it just walks people through, right? And so that's something that I did as a big project, and that's oftentimes what people do after they get a great surplus of blog articles that are, you know, really, really effective. Absolutely. All right, so for the last question, I've, I've rounded up a, a bunch that we have here that kind of fit into the same um, area, I think, of concern of a lot of, a lot of small business owners who are first getting into content marketing and want to kind of take a stab at it themselves. You know, what do you, what do you suggest for, you know, the, the small business owner who may not have the best, you know, writing ability or blogging ability? You know, what do you suggest? Do they pr produce content even knowing that they're, they may not have, you know, the best foot forward as far as putting their, their company out there? In, uh, in Love this and question, man. I got so many you know, opinions on this they... one, Justin. I'll just, I'll just, you know, I could talk on day on this one alone. Take it. Go ahead. All right. So if you go back and read the original articles on River Pools and Spas four years ago, they stink. They're like a turd. And um, those turds, though, have produced a lot of dang sales. So all of us have to accept that we're going to be very imperfect. This is not NASA. This is not a space shuttle. And, um, and if it's imperfect, that's great because it means you're growing. The goal is that you're trying to get better, but that's the only goal. The goal is not perfection. The goal is just improving with each and every video that you make, article you write. If you look at the most successful companies and individuals online right now have built the biggest brands online, leads traffic sales online, it's the ones that were willing to be utterly imperfect at first. I am a great example of that, and that's why it drives me nuts when I hear people talk about don't do it unless it's awesome, epic, blah, 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 and then we scare everybody to death. There's a tremendous amount of great thought leaders and writers out there right now that are scared to hit the daggone keys on their keyboard because they're worried it's not going to be awesome. So that's that. There is other options too. Um, for give you a couple examples. One, you could you could leverage a company like Digital Sherpa. That's something that they do. They help their clients with. They find means for them to get that content out there, right? So you might want to use some type of agency. Another option that you have specifically that I I um, I came up with after talking to so many business owners was. A lot of people have problems with outsourcing their blog content because it's just not done in their voice. It's kind of wanky. It doesn't sound very good. And so I set this system up on the sales line. You'll find it under EBB, Easy Biz Blogging, top navigation bar, Easy Biz Blogging, or you can just um, um, Google Easy Biz Blogging. How it works is what we do is we brainstorm those common questions that you get, and then we have somebody, one of our team members, calls you up on the phone, and you just verbally answer those questions to that person. They kind of – like a reporter, they just ask you to have a conversation with you. The call is recorded, and then each question answer is transcribed. That transcription is turned into a blog post. 
I've had a tremendous amount of success with that, with those persons that really have it inside their head. They have it in their mind. They can talk about it, but they just hate writing or they're uh, fearful writing, whatever. So that's called easy biz blogging. It's, you'll find it right there on the sales line. And like I said, it's, it's really took off as soon as I launched it. It was like 60, 90 days ago I launched it and it just kind of took off like wildfire. It's doing really, really well. Um, and you can outsource it. There's other outsourcing companies as well that you can just say, hey, you know, do this for me. One's called Xeris, uh, Z-E-R-Y-U-S, I believe is how you spell it. So there's a lot of different options when it comes to people helping you produce your content. Uh, and one other one, I help a lot of my clients with this. So like let's say there's a good writer on staff that has the capability to write and to interview. You have a lot of good thought leaders. So that writer could go to these to these people that work for you and you could just do that interview-based format. They could record those answers, and they could go back, and they could uh, do it themselves. So that's a method of insourcing the talent that you have within your own company and creating that um, question, interview, record, transcribe, post article. And now it's done in that person's voice, and it's got their name next to the article, and they feel great about it, but they didn't have to type a single key or write a single word. Absolutely. Tons of, tons of great resources out there. All right, so we're at 2 o'clock. Um, anything else, Marcus, you want to add to, to kind of cap it off? Oh, man, it's just, this was so great, Justin. I appreciate what you guys, you know, there at Digital Shepherd are doing. And, and uh, you know, we're all just getting started with this. And, and again, I just can't stress enough. Embrace imperfection. Um, don't be afraid of anything. Focus on that cost, those problems, those comparisons, those verses, those reviews, and the best. If you just focus on those alone, you'll have an unlimited supply of content and you'll start getting results and then use that content as your greatest sales tool and it's going to be very, very effective. Thank you all so very much for your time today. It was my pleasure. Fantastic. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to tweet them to us at Digital Shirt Buzz, plural, or I'm sure uh, you can make sure you follow Marcus at, at the sales lion. Um, like I said before, we'll go ahead and email out the presentation to everybody, and uh, we want to thank you, everyone, for attending today. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, buddy.